Here is paroxysmic nature of sin. Have any of you, you could just raise your hand, seen uh, the movie Picture of Dorian Gray or read the book? Read the book, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's a wonderful book, a ca captivating book. This is, I, I took this image from the 1945 movie. Uh, I like old movies. <laughs> so th there it is, Picture of Dorian Gray. It's. I won't give away the ending, but I do have to give away parts of it. Dorian Gray, he's, he's a young man at the peak of his powers. He's, a, he's an aristocrat. He has lots, lots of money, he's well-educated. Well um, uh, he's very intelligent. He's, he, 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 he looks young and, and he's good looking. And um, so somebody, his friend, a friend of his, uh, draws a portrait, a full body portrait of him. And uh, through some nefarious uh, acts, Dorian Gray makes a, uh, uh, makes a deal with the forces of darkness. Uh, he, he makes a deal whereby the portrait that's painted of him would grow old, but he would never grow old. He would stay at the peak of his powers, always. And uh, as, he, as we see in the movie and read in the book, he started sinning. He, he started down a path of sin, a very severe path of sin. And already with the first uh, couple sins, we see that his face started changing in, in the portrait, in the picture, in the painting. And we see, we see here, uh, after the first few sins, uh, he has a little bit of cynicism there. Uh, he's not looking as nice as he, as he once looked, uh, but he looks the same. It's the portrait of him that is, that is changing. And then, with time, after he travels down this, this very, very dark, sinful, sinful path, sinful road, well, he looks fine. 20 years later, he looks great. But uh, here's what the pi picture, at least the, uh, the, the film version of the picture looks like. It doesn't look too good, right? Here, here's, the, here's the original picture, and that's what the picture looked like towards the end of the movie. I don't know if any of you saw that movie, 1945. And I think Oscar Wilde is telling us something here. I, I was captivated when I saw this movie. It made me think about uh, what he might be telling us. But uh, sin has a way of destroying us not only of destroying the soul, it destroys our whole being. Right? Uh, it destroys us physically uh, as, as well as mentally. And I think that's at least part of what Oscar Wilde was trying to tell. He wasn't a Christian, by the way, but I think th that's uh, what he's implying. Oscar Wilde has, a, if I remember correctly, it's his comment. Uh, a famous comment, he says, we all get the faith we deserve by the time we're 50. Uh, it's, it's our deeds, our character comes out in our faith. Uh, so, okay, so what does that have to do with parasites? What does it have to do with sin? Um, th doesn't it seem that something was taken away from the original picture to the original portrait to, to the latter one? Something is missing, something was taken away. Uh, a great deal of him, maybe even part of his humanity, was taken away. Parasite. What, what is a parasite? A parasite, this is from the CDC website, Center for Disease Control. A parasite is an organism that lives, that lives on or in a host and gets its food, or gets its food from or at the expense of its host. So I suggest, well, uh, after Ken, I suggest that sin is a conceptual cousin of parasites. Uh, what do you mean conceptual cousin? Well, sin is not a, an entity. It's not a biological being. It's not something that, that exists in and of itself. It doesn't go in the corner and walk around. Uh, sin is a conceptual cousin. Uh, parasites are, of course, biological entities. But there, there, is, there are analogous features here between the, the sin and the biological parasite, and that is both feed off their host. Both destroy their host if left alone, right? Um, 
So, so that's, what, that's what they have in common. Uh, and they need a host in order to, to, to live. Uh, so let me start from the beginning. So how is, how is a sin like a parasite? Let me, again, let me start at the beginning. We all know that uh, towards the end of the sixth day of creation, God looks at his creation, Genesis 131, and he's, he doesn't just say it's good. He says it's very good. Everything God created is very, is very good. It fits a function. It fits God's plan, God's purpose. And, and it's very good. So where does evil come from? Where does sin, where does, where does, let's talk about evil. Where does evil come from? It's not something that exists. If it exists, God would have, have, would have had to create it. But of course, God doesn't create evil. So everything that God created is good. So, so sin or, or evil is more like a lack, a lack of something, a privation. It's, uh, this is Augustine's point. Um, uh, and it comes, you know, from Plato, but it, uh, Augustine develops it. So, so what Augustine says is, is evil is a privation. It's, it, it refers to things that uh, an entity should have, but it, that it's missing. Okay, sin is a privation. In what sense? What does that mean? Uh, sin is a lack or an absence of something that a thing, sh that a thing should have. Well, think of disease. Uh, a disease a person with with a disease in their hand, maybe arthritis, they, they lack health. They're missing the health that should be there so that the fingers function as they ought to. They can't function well because something is missing, right? So, so also think of maybe a simpler example, the rot in a tree. A tree maybe has holes in its trunk. Something's missing, something's not there. It's not something, oh, I'm talking about evil, I'm sorry, uh, privation, evil. So the, the tree is pr has a privation. It has holes in its trunk. Or think of the, uh, an ear that doesn't hear, or an eye that cannot see. Privation. Pri it's not a sin, but it's, we could say, or we could talk about in terms of evil. These are things that should uh, be able to perform their function, or if they have a function, but they can't because something is lacking. Okay, so if we could, we could think of evil that way. And we can think of, and, and we can think of sin also as a type of evil. It, what type of evil is sin? Well, sin is the type of evil that, according to Augustine, dwells in the human will. We all have, um, we, we all have free will. Um, and, and sin dwells in it. So think of sin uh, as a parasite in the human soul. It feeds off its host. What host? It feeds off the human will. And what, what, do, you, what do you mean it feeds off the human will? Well, it, it, it attaches itself to the will and it, and it dis, disrupts or disorders the human will. For, and I'm using Augustine's uh, philosophy and theology here, uh, which, I, which I agree with, of course. Uh, so for, for Augustine, the, the end of the will, the, the, that which the will points at, and that which the will, the will should seek at all times is first and foremost God, right? Love God above all things. So the, a rightly ordered will is a will that first and foremost seeks after God and, and seeks after other things in relation, in proper relationship to God. Um, Augustine talks about different, uh, different desires um, that, that, that we have and the different needs that we have and, he, and, and our desire or our love for these things, right? And he calls these loves. So uh, Augustine talks about how our loves should be rightly ordered, rightly aligned, and uh, according to what? Love for God. And you could say maybe love for, for God, love for neighbor, and you align everything in its proper place in accord with, with, with that. Okay, uh, the parasite of sin comes into the human will and rearranges, restructures that. Yeah. So, so now we have a disordered will. And maybe you could talk about a disordered soul. And uh, how might we... Um, exemplify that? What, what might that look like? Well, I'm going to give you a few examples. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the first example. 
Uh, again, I took this from um, Augustine, Book 11 of the City of God. He, Augustine talks about something called the libido dominandi. Li libido, li libido is desire, or, uh, but has a negative connotation, and it means really lust or, or disordered desire. Disordered desire for what? Disordered desire to dominate. Uh, disordered desire to conquer. Uh, to, to dominate, to have authority over, or to c command something. Well, the best image I can find in that is a picture here of Rome in its, in its, all, its, in all its glory. The uh, emperors of Rome had, uh, had libido dominandi, I, be, I believe, right? They wanted, they wanted to conquer the world, and, and uh, Rome did grow big and, big and rich and, and beautiful. But, but what was the price uh, that they had on their soul? But this, just, this is an example um, of, a, of a sin. Uh, how is it a sin? Well, we seek after, people who have this, this sin, seek, seek after power, control, right? And, and it becomes like, like a parasite, takes away from us. It, in a sense, a little by little, it, it dehumanizes us. And will talk about that in a little bit. But this is just an example of a, a, of, the, of a sin that we could that we could see as a parasite, maybe. I, here, here uh, to go deeper into this example, uh, think of Lord of the Rings. Think of the nine the nine kings with the nine rings, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and these rings gave them great power, didn't it? And they started really uh, having a lust, uh, developing a lust for the power that it gave them. So much so that after a while, all they wanted was the power that the rings gave them. And the, uh, what, eight of the rings went away and there was only one ring left. So they, they devoted their whole self to searching after that ring. Again, sin, what, what does sin do in our soul? It, it destroys us and, and left alone. It, it'll, it'll destroy us completely. I think that J.R. Tolkien, um, his, what he described goes along well with what Augustine says about the privation, uh, sin as a privation, uh, and, or sin, sin also as a parasite. Uh, this is what the Nine Kings, according to the, uh, the movie producers, look like after. The Nine Kings became the ring wraith right? They became dark, shadowy, evil, evil creatures who only wanted one thing, right? They only wanted to uh, get a hold of the ring. It, in a sense, this, this sin, this parasite, destroyed them little by little by little to the point where you can't even tell that these were nine kings, right? So sin, in, in a sense, uh, dehumanizes us. Again, we could uh, if you think of the portrait of Dorian Gray, you could see that same idea, that same concept. And I'll give you one more example from the Lord of the Rings. Think of Smeagol, it's the other way around. Well, Store Hobbit, Smeagol, yeah. Uh, so Smeagol, uh, Smeagol was a, what is called a Store Hobbit, but again, the lust for power, the libido dominandi that was in his soul uh, pr was pretty much destroying him. I mean, there, there's a big difference there, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so there it is. Uh, so again, uh, J.R. Tolkien, I think, covered that concept well. L let me give you another example, and this is uh, from classical literature. <laughs> this is uh, from Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, right? The three books in the, Div in the Divine Comedy. This is from the Inferno. Um, in, the, in the fifth circle of hell. So, uh, so hell has nine circles, right? And in the fifth circle, we have the uh, people who gave themselves over to the, to the sin of anger. Uh, think of anger as one of the seven deadly sins in classical theology, or one of the seven deadly vices. I don't know if you've heard of it, talked in those terms. But anger, anger is one of them. Uh, Dante depicts the sinners, uh, of the, the sinners, by the way, that are in hell. Uh, again, they're not full human beings. They, uh, in the translation that I read, they are called shades. Uh, 
you know, think, think of a shade that's not, not a full, uh, or a shadow, you can see my own shadow here. The shadow is not, a, is not me, it's not, it's not human. Uh, so also these people are less than human, why? Because sin was allowed to run amok in their soul, destroying them. Okay, so here we have uh, Dante. Uh, he's traveling in a boat in, a, in the uh, uh, river Styx, uh, dark, um, muddy waters of the river Styx, and the wrathful are there. And, and what is the punishment uh, of the wrathful? The, the wrathful, by the way, are those who expressed their anger. And so those who express their anger, you could see an image of them there. They're, they're constantly fighting with one another. Um, anybody says anything that anyone can detect as a, as a slight upon their character, and they, be begin, they begin biting and, and, and punching and, and tearing at one another. And uh, that's the way he describes them. They gave themselves over to the vice of, of anger, the wrathful. But there are also the swollen. The swollen, these are the people who have unexpressed anger. And uh, you can't see them because they're below the murky waters. But Dante knows they're there because he could uh, hear gurgling and he, he could see bubbles coming up to the surface. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's, an, that's another example of sin becoming a vice. But we could ask the question, well, that's nice. These are nice images, right? Uh, Oscar Wilde and J.R. Tolkien and Dante, they all have maybe images that we could interpret uh, as sin being parasitic on the soul or on the mind or on the uh, human will. That's fine. But is it true? <laughs> this is all theology and literature. Is it true? Uh, is it true that sin destroys us the way maybe these people, these authors are suggesting? And the answer is yes, <laughs> it does destroy us. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you a couple examples, right? Uh, studies on, on, on unexpressed and expressed anger have linked it to loneliness, chronic anxiety, depression, eating disorders, uh, sleep disorders, obsessive compulsive behavior, phobias. If we're all angry, uh, we get angry at times, and there's something called righteous anger, right? Um, that, that's fine, but if we allow anger to go uncontrolled. We make that part of a, our character, um, a habit within us, right? A deeply entrenched habit, a vice. Then what happens? Then the, what happens is this. This is the result. These are the consequences. Now think of a person. So this is in the soul, right? We have anger in our soul. You can't see anger in the soul uh, or, or, in, the, or in, the, um, in the will. But can uh, do, do people who are depressed, have chronic anxiety, have eating disorder, sleeping disorder, do they look different than those who don't? Uh, something's wrong with them, right? Uh, there's a privation there. There's something that's lacking. Do they not? So the, here, here the idea comes back, right? Uh, the parasite of sin destroys us fr from the inside and <laughs> from without also. It, it, dis it destroys our whole being. Okay. And I think um, I have one more example. And this is Dante talking about the sexually lustful. And here we are in the second circle of uh, hell where the sexually lustful reside, the shades who have given themselves over to sexual lust reside. And again, he, he paints interesting pictures of, of these sinners. So what you see here is uh, you see something like a, a, a cloud that's c going up in concentric circles there. Well, this cloud is made up of shades, this, uh, of sinners. They are all being taken up by storms, infernal, you could say, infernal storms that um, arise in, the, in that, second, in that uh, second circle all of a sudden. Um, these sinners, these sexually lustful, they dwell in complete darkness and privation, the privation of light. They dwell in complete darkness and all of a sudden these storms arise and they pick, these storms pick them up, shake them around, thrashes them about and dashes them to the ground, injuring them. Okay. What is he talking about? 
to, to what is he referring, Don Dante, right? Um, lust, the person who has, who has cultivated the vice of lust, right? Who has developed the vice of lust. That, that person is like these people, whenever that person sees an image or sees a person that they might be attracted to, what happens, right? The, the emotions swell up from the, from the inside and, and their imaginations go, go wild, right? The emotions, they're thrashing them around and dashing, uh, and then it dashes them to the ground with unrequited passion. Uh, th there it is. It's all Dante describes it in a pictorial manner. But we, again, we could ask the question, okay, that's nice, Dante. That's a nice image. Is there any truth to it? Does it really destroy us in, in the way you're, you're suggesting? And I would say uh, yes. And, and uh, just recorded a YouTube video on this with, with, with George uh, based on an article, another article that I, that I wrote. But, but whenever we express ourselves sexually, and, um, certain hormones are released. And, uh, and a number of hormones are released, but I want to focus in on two of these hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin mainly in women, um, vasopressin mainly, mainly in men. Uh, these are known as hormones of attachment, hormones of bonding. Um, when two people express themselves sexually, it, these hormones are released in relatively great quantities. They're also released at other times during other activities, but here they're released at, uh, in, in great quantities, relatively speaking. And these hormones uh, attract us more to the other person, help us become more attracted to the other person, help us have greater trust for the other person. These are emotions, right? These are feelings, and, and, and it, and it binds us existentially, emotionally, to, to that person, whether we like it or not. That, that's the, the, therein lies the problem, right? Whether we like it or not. So w what happens is, um, there are books written about this, yeah? Many college women, they, they go to college and they, they start, uh, well, they find themselves outside of their home, outside the supervision of their parents, and they, they start engaging in and uh, sexual liaisons, and all of a sudden, they start experiencing bouts of depression. What, what's going on? They don't, they don't know why they're experiencing this. They go to the counselor, and they, they report that to the counselor, but what's going on? Well, what's going on is they're, they are attaching themselves to, to, um, to the person with whom they express themselves sexually, and then they're detaching themselves, and then they attach themselves and detach themselves. Well, you know what? what when that happens, when that happens, these, these hormones uh, were not created by God to, to work that way. So, so when that happens, the, these hormones start losing their, their power. They start losing, losing their function. Uh, one of the books that I read said it's like tape. When we use tape to tape, let's say, two things, put two things together, and we, if we rip that tape out and we put it on another two things and rip it out, if we do that a number of times, this tape will start losing its function. Well, same thing with these hormones. They all start lose, losing its function. And when that happens, uh, people get addicted to sex or they are on the path of addiction to sex because the other hormones are released and the other hormones, uh, some of the other hormones are, are connected to, uh, or... Uh, some of the other hormones, I should say, make us feel good, make us feel well. So we, now we're just after the feeling and, not, and we're not uh, engaging others for, for, the sake of, um, for, for the sake of unity, for the sake of love or anything else. So God created these hormones to be expressed in marriage. And, and be, be, uh, initially, initially because of these hormones and for, of course, many, many other reasons, but initially because of these hormones, we, we are able to bind with our spouse and, and go on this path where we bind deeper and deeper every, every year with our spouse. That's what God created these hormones to do, and they serve that purpose very well. When we abuse them, when we use them outside the proper context for which God has designed them, well, they start, they, they don't work as well. And what happens is when, when the person starts engaging in several uh, sexual liaisons, they start feeling empty inside, and something is missing. Well, 
God created sexual expression within the marriage to deepen uh, unity and deepen love, right? You start, you, and, but if you do otherwise, then you start, um, then you engage in, in, in many shallow relationships and, and something is missing, something is lacking. You have a privation. You, you don't, you no longer have the ability to, to unite in, in a deep and abiding love with somebody else. That's the privation. That's the sin of lust. That's what it does to us. So these are some of the examples that I've given you for why we can uh, think of sin as a parasite, right? Parasite that destroys a soul and body. Thank you. Thank you.